technology. So um, let's let's begin here. And uh, again, welcome back to the Gates Air Connect Virtual Events Webinar Series. My name is Keith Adams. I'm the Global Marketing and Communications Manager for Gates Air. And thank you all for taking time out with us to attend this first in the series presentation. Um, in the absence of several canceled or postponed industry events around the world, we're reaching out digitally with an unprecedented amount of streaming interactive content over the next few months. And while this doesn't necessarily take the place of seeing you all face to face in Vegas, uh, we do hope that we can inform, entertain and even engage you with some really interesting material here. Um, and in today's webinar, Advances in Television Transmission Solutions, uh, Gates Air Senior Product Manager for TV, Martin Horspool, will tell us all about our VHF and UHF transmitter innovations for this year and for the years to come, uh, cutting edge remote user interfaces and integrated functionality that enhances and extends your distribution capabilities. Um, as always, <clears throat> a question and answer session will take place at the end of this presentation. Uh, so we uh, we encourage you to enter in any kind of questions you might have in the Microsoft Teams Q&A panel. And I'm going to make an announcement um, just to show, hey, here it is. Here's the uh, Q&A session. So we'll be answering questions in a first come, first serve manner. So feel free to enter any question at your convenience uh, throughout the presentation. So uh, let's get on with the webinar. Um, Martin, are you um, able to share your screen? Because that's the one thing I cannot quite see. Uh, hold on. OK, Keith, can you see my screen? I can. All right. All right. And ideally, everyone else can too. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Martin Horsepool. Martin. Thank you, Keith, for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. As Keith mentioned, this is a substitute, a rather poor one, in place of the big NAB show and some other trade shows that have been either postponed or cancelled. So um, we have quite a lot to cover. Um, there are several webinars or virtual events as we like to call them. Uh, the first one is uh, quite extensive in terms of its coverage. First, I'd like to uh, hopefully you can see my slide number two. Uh, the virtual event topics for today include a quick discussion about our innovative high efficiency television transmitters, and they, they're really, really a combination of VHF, UHF, different technologies, air cooled um, and liquid cooled, low power to high power. Most of the low power uh, discussion will be saved for a future presentation on low power TV. So this will be focused more on the high power end of the product line. Um, I'm also going to show you the current state of our newest HTML5 GUIs um, and also some advanced security measures that we're taking to increase or enhance the security of your television transmitter site because anything connected on the internet these days is prone to hackers and people attempting to, to gain control or access. So we're, we're, we're overcoming that with some security features. I'm also going to introduce um, our newest version of an integrated satellite receiver and a little discussion about um, IP content distribution through the transmitter system. Uh, virtual events not covered today that will be covered in some future um, virtual events are flexible low power television transmission systems, our outdoor transmitter uh, system, which will be reviewed and some suitable applications for it. And then finally, the last one that I will be conducting will be total cost of ownership and basically ways of deploying high efficiency transmitter systems to save money and even pay for the cost of the new equipment. There are many other virtual events that you can find on our website too. Before I get started, I'd just like to make everything clear. Some people um, have, don't quite understand the relationship that Gates Air has with our Italian side of the company it was a company called OneTastic that we had known for many, many years. Uh, we had actually been selling some of their products, the low power end of their products for about five years now. So we had a very good long term relationship that actually dates back beyond that, probably oh, 10 years or so. Uh, one thing to be clear, and I've been over there a few times and I can tell you that the engineering staff at our um, division in Italy is, is the finest that there is. They, they have excellent excellent engineers that can design very, very um, well thought out circuitry and transmitters. 
Um, we also visited their major component suppliers like filters and passive products, things like that, and found that they're very supportive of this company. They get excellent support and pricing. Uh, we also in interviewed and looked at some of their customers prior to the acquisition and found that uh, their customers were rather enthusiastic, in fact, about the product quality and very enthusiastic about being part of the Gates Air uh, company. So uh, in summary, really both engineering teams have now been integrated and we're combining the best technology from Europe with the best technology in the USA. Um, there are two main manufacturing locations. The historic one or the, 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 you know, the original one is the Gates Air factory. that's always been in Quincy, Illinois in USA. Um, for a long time, this was part of Harris Corporation, the broadcast division, uh, but more recently became the Gates Air company. Uh, the, the other facility, which is a northern part of Italy in Lombardy, which is not too far from Milan, uh, is in Italy and it's shown on the map here. So basically we got two locations uh, which allows us very good coverage in different regions. Beyond that, we actually have several sales offices around the world and several support locations as well. Uh, looking at products from both sides briefly, because even though it's one company, uh, some people will refer to Gates Air SRL as the Italian side and the USA side and from Quincy, uh, you will find there are some differences in products offerings. Um, on the left side, you'll see the Gates Air USA product portfolio or a very brief snapshot of parts of it. Uh, we cover all digital TV solutions needed basically uh, from low, medium, high power. We do not build any analog television transmitters today. We used to, uh, but as the world market has gradually declined, we found it's uh, better to focus on digital TV only. And we had some very good reasons to do that, particularly with Repack um, in, in the USA and other parts of the world requiring a lot of new digital transmitters. Um, for translators, single frequency network, gap fillers, those types of products, I say partial because we do have low power transmitters, but they're not simply configurable to translators, for example, or transposers. So to do that, we'd already had a partnership with the uh, then Wantastic company in Italy where we would resell their products, rebadge them and so forth. Of course, we've gone one step more than that now and it's all, all one company. Uh, the product side of the USA all support HSC 3.0 from the get go. In other words, it's built in. It's just a software upgrade. We have liquid cooled UHF, but we never developed uh, a USA model for liquid cooled VHF. Moving over to the Italian side, uh, the product portfolio there includes digital television, analog television, because there are many parts of the world that still broadcast in analog, believe it or not. Um, they had a full range uh, of very sophisticated transposers, translators, single frequency network gap fillers. Uh, low power products were really the emphasis of some of their designs. Uh, they have a wide array of power levels, product designs, modularity and other features which primarily I will discuss uh, on a virtual event it will be live on April 16th uh, in the USA and that actually translates to the 17th in the morning in parts of Asia when we do the second uh, airing of the virtual event. Uh, they also have in Italy uh, VHF liquid cooled which I'll discuss in today's presentation. So looking first at the USA product line in a bit, little bit more detail on slide number six, you will see that we have an XTE exciter, which I'll discuss briefly. And that's basically the heart of all of the transmitters to the right and below. So the XT exciter is capable of UHF or VHF uh, on any frequency. It's basically frequency agile. And it's used as the, the heart or the brains to drive all of the amplifiers uh, coupled with control systems and cooling systems of larger transmitters. You can see on the far right, we have extremely large transmitters. In fact, we can configure systems up to 150 kilowatts should any customer in the world ever require that. Uh, we haven't, as far as I know, shipped any that size yet, but we have shipped some around 100 kilowatt power level already. Uh, the product line for UHF looks very similar to, to the VHF product line. And I'll add that we do also do band one, which is low band TV for the US market, as well as band three for the worldwide market. And in parts of Europe, that's used for DAB, DAB plus as well. So I'm going to talk briefly about our 
digital TV exciter. So can anybody tell me where all of these exciters on this slide were built? The answer is in Quincy, Illinois. So on slide number eight, um, I just wanted a quick history here to show you that we, we didn't suddenly develop a digital exciter. We've had digital exciters since 1996. The first one we built was called the CD1. It was quite large and heavy, four rack units. It was an ATSC only exciter designed for the US ATSC 8 VSB market that only supported that modulation. Um, didn't even have adaptive pre-correction. It had manual correction, so it was a little bit tricky to set up, but once set up, very good. Uh, that iterated into a CD1A, which had linear adaptive um, correction. And then the big breakthrough was something called Apex, which was an exciter that had full uh, linear, nonlinear adaptive correction. It's our third generation exciter. Did again start with ATSC, but we did add ISDBT for the uh, South American market later in its life. Um, and then the next uh, big step was the Apex M2X, which basically um, was a much more sophisticated exciter because it had software defined modulation, enabled us to support pretty much all digital standards around the world. Uh, and that, that exciter was in service for many, many years, eight, nine, ten years now. Some, some of these have been shipped. So we've been building those exciters for quite a long time. And then the newest exciter is the XTE. You'll notice as these exciters have uh, gradually got smaller down to one RU box, fifth generation. Again, software defined modulation, um, much more processing power. You know, the adaptive correction is faster. Um, the performance is better in terms of MER, SNR, shoulder levels and so forth. But the big ad here was we also um, scaled it with enough memory or storage rather to to have ATSC 3.0, which is a more complex waveform generated. So it's basically our ATSC 3.0 exciter um, and all other modulations going forward. So uh, next slide, uh, slide number nine, is basically a quick review of all of the characteristics. I'll just highlight a few of these. Um, so it has dual transport stream inputs, and these can be either ASI, SEMT 310M, or we have ASI over IP, which is another input I'll talk about later. And for HSC3 or 3.0, we have what we call native IP inputs, which is part of the standard. Uh, we also have auto switching between two any two inputs. We've used a settable buffer length so that it becomes seamless. Uh, supports digital TV modulations, not analog. DAB, DAB plus. It's frequency agile, so we have one box. It covers all of the low band, high band, VHF plus UHF bands. Uh, a nice feature of this is the internal battery. We call it a UPS because basically it takes over. If the power glitches, even for a second, you don't want the box to have to reboot because that, even though it's fast, it takes about 30, 35 seconds. You want to avoid that. It will ride through uh, power, short power outages. In fact, it will it'll ride um, through power outages as long as 15 minutes. I just want to show you one circuit board that's the heart of the exciter. It's the modulator. Uh, has a lot of high-tech components in it. Um, so I have a quick question. I know I can't hear any answers, but somebody you might want to guess how many layers, printed circuit board layers, are inside this PCB itself. And it's fairly thin board. How many layers do you think there are? The answer is 16. So you can see that's a fairly sophisticated board. There's a lot of wiring within that circuit board. It's not evident just by looking at the top of it. Looking at the XTE exciter with the front removed, the front panel and the lid removed, you can see the inside. There are only a few boards. It looks very, very simple. Um, on the left, power supplies. There's an AC power supply, it just brings in standard um, single phase AC, converts it to the DC voltages required for the boards inside the exciter. But in the front part of this is a battery control module and the battery itself, even though you can only see a tab sticking out, that is removable from the front, so it's very easy to replace. Uh, you'll also see that the fans, which are on the front side, are, are plugged in, they're DC, low voltage, very easy to replace without removing the exciter from the whole rack or from the transmitter. And there's a small power amp in the back. We did leave some extra space just in case we ever decided to put a larger power amp um, in, in this box. There's a little bit of room left. So having introduced Exciter, let's talk a little bit about the air-cooled television transmitter line. This is the series from the USA. So 
moving up in size from the exciter, which actually produces only 100 milliwatts, we have a product um, that fits into a two rec unit chassis. And basically contained within the chassis is the XDE exciter circuitry plus a power amp plus a larger power supply. So this becomes in different configurations a standalone 2RU rack mount VHF or UHF transmitter. Incidentally, this unit is also used as the exciter driver for all of our higher power air cooled transmitter systems. So it includes the same features as the exciter, like the plug in battery UPS supports all the modulations and so forth. Uh, fairly recent introductions to this uh, originally went to 100 watts. Uh, that was soon extended to 150 watts, but we've also added some high efficiency Doherty power amplifier stages for 100 watts and 200 watts, which basically means that the maximum power level for this series of transmitter in two rack units is now extended to 200 watts. And that's true for both VHF and UHF. So I thought it would be interesting to show the inside of this box, the two rack unit transmitter. And you can see that other than the front panel, which I didn't have a picture of, there are only really four major sub assemblers inside the, uh, the unit. There's a 50 volt power supply that's dedicated to power the power amp assembly. There's the exciter power supply, which is identical to the XTE one because that's what it is. There's the modulator board, which is the same one I've just previously uh, showed you. And then there's a the power amp assembly, which, which has its own cooling fan, but it is removable as a unit from the front. Once the front panel is removed, you can unscrew this and slide it out. So it is a plug in assembly. So you can see that the, uh, the way this box is assembled, it's very easy to, to service should you ever need to replace a part. Then we decided that we needed a bigger standalone transmitter, one that didn't necessarily have to have separate exciters, or separate PAs, just a standalone box, very easy to install because everything's inside one unit. So we developed a four rack unit transmitter that in UHF <clears throat> is capable of up to 600 watts in different configurations, in VHF band three up to 800 watts. And I believe in DAB uh, digital audio broadcast, it'll do one kilowatt. Uh, again, it just has the XD exciter, and if you look at this design, directly below it is the power amp section. And we took that same power amp and used it in a larger system where we can multiply it. So we can have one, two, three, four, up to eight uh, air-cooled amplifiers in a rack driven by an exciter driver transmitter control, which is basically the 2RU transmitter. An exciter switcher is an option, of course, available for dual drive. And I'll show the dual drive option. Now, one interesting feature with this transmitter system is once you add the second exciter driver, you are also adding a second transmitter control system. So the control becomes 100% redundant. You can see from the front panel, each one has on off buttons and nav buttons and a little blue LCD display. Each one also has an ethernet port on the front for local access and LAN WAN ports on the back for remote access. There's another nice feature. Each PA module, and this applies by the way to the standalone uh, four rack unit transmitter, each PA module has space built in and pre-wired for a second power supply. So we have available redundant power supply option per PA for those that wish to have that level of redundancy. And with that option, you can unplug a power supply stay on at full power. No amplifier would drop in power with this with that option. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, on the right is just a chart showing some of the models. I skipped a few because I wanted to get the low end and the high end in, but you can see we basically go from 600 watts to 25.6 kilowatts in, in band three, 19 kilowatts in UHF, and 30 kilowatts in band one or low band V. And the next slide, I'm on number 17, uh, shows the whole range of air-cooled USA designed and manufactured transmitters from um, what I call a 10 watt, actually in UHF is capable of 16 watts, all the way up to 19.2 kilowatts. And this slide shows you the number of racks, the number of um, uh, the power and the model number uh, for each band. So moving on, um, liquid cooled transmitters. And this has really been a keystone of our um, USA repack. Has been our ULX, says ULX, but actually it's a ULX TE series 
Um, the transmitter shown in this particular slide on the intro slide has three racks, nine power blocks, and is rated at about 56 kilowatts of average um, power either in HSC1 or HSC3 or any other OFDM TV modulation. So it's, it has to cover a wide range because we found around the world that uh, there are demands for liquid cooled transmitters down to quite low power levels. We see people asking for one or two kilowatt liquid cooled transmitters. Um, so we had to scale this both ways, both down in power and up in power. We did this using building blocks or power blocks. Uh, the transmitter on the left that says 6.6 .6 kilowatts actually has 10 power amplifiers in it. So it's quite granular and by using just two power amplifiers. Um, <clears throat> it scales the power down to 1.4 kilowatts, but with 10 PAs in it, it's rated at 6.6 .6 kilowatts. And in a larger rack, a taller rack, we can put three such power blocks scaling the power up to just above 19 kilowatts in, again in any modulation. All of these transmitters use um, high efficiency, latest design, asymmetrical and symmetrical Doherty amplifiers depending on the channel band. Next slide shows um, a preview of all of the single ended power levels and you can see it's very granular. We have lots of combinations of modules and power levels so we can basically fit the product to suit the customer's requirements as close as possible. A lot of people don't want to buy a transmitter that's twice as big as you need or close to that. In the case of the old days, you know, in the old days when we had tube transmitters, we jumped from like 30 kilowatts to 60 kilowatts to 90 kilowatts. You know, you don't have to do that anymore. You can basically pick a transmitter that runs at the power level that you want or very close to it. Some people want a bit of headroom, of course, which you can always go up to the next one if you want to. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, the power level on the right is actually applicable to all modulations, both HSC1, HSC3, DBBT, T2, ISDBT. If you want a really big transmitter, we make what we call a dual transmitter or dual tran, and the biggest one would have uh, eight cabinets, one control cabinet, and will provide 150 kilowatts. I thought it'd be nice to show a picture. I know most of you listening don't have large transmitters unless you're in the USA where you might. Um, but for other people around the world, a big transmitter install looks a bit like this. In fact, this is one that was in the process of being installed, installation almost complete. I believe the picture was taken a couple of years ago now. Part of the repack process, the station in North Carolina purchased a 75 kilowatt transmitter. It's four power amplifier, uh, four amplifier racks, and again, rated for both HSC1 and HSC3 on the same power level. He's actually running it at around 67 kilowatts because that's his license power. A couple more, a few more pictures here. As you can see, it's quite extensive. Um, individual mask filters per cabinet. Reject loads are in blue in the center picture. And each each rack or each cabinet has its own pump system and cooling system. So there's a lot of redundancy in the cooling system as well here. So now I'm going to move to the other side of the Atlantic. Look at a product that we were going to introduce at NAB this year, an all new liquid cooled VHF transmitter series. This is manufactured and designed um, in our Italian part of the company in Brescia. So uh, I will point out that these models are available in band one, low band, and also in UHF. But today we're going to focus on the VHF one. The model numbers are shown on the right on this slide. On the left, a few key features. Obviously, we wanted high efficiency. The efficiency of these transmitters is typically above 40%, including the cooling system. Um, the Italian design also has, the Italian part of Gates Air, also has um, integrated the dual pumps inside the rack. So all of these models shown here on the right, even the highest power levels, have integrated pumps inside the racks. Uh, there's some few clever features here, like automatic coolant refilling, this reduces on-site maintenance. Should there be a very, very, very slow reduction in coolant level, this will automatically top up the system, not requiring a site visit. Another nice feature is each PA already has built into it 100% power supply redundancy. And I'll explain that on the following slide. Uh, they also bought HSC1, DBBT, DBBT2, ISDBT, and even analog. They also support DAB and DAB plus, of course, because they're VHF band three transmitters. 
the question might arise, is there an upgrade path to HSC3? And the answer is with the current modulator, no, but there is an upgrade path coming and we'll have more details on that when it becomes available. Looking more closely at one of the power amplifiers, and this picture at the top of the slide shows the power amplifier with the front cover removed. You can see clearly there are three plug-in power supplies. These actually are the 2.725 kilowatt GE power um, OEM power supplies that we already use in our radio product line in the US and almost identical to the ones used in our ULXTE and VAXTE products in the US. This is just a slightly lower power version of that same unit. Very efficient, hot swap, front access, but real beauty is if you look to the right, you don't need all three for 100% power. If you unplug any one of those power supplies, it still makes 100% power. So should you have a red light on one, should it ever fail, which is highly unlikely, it can be swapped out on site uh, at any time that's convenient for you because your transmitter is still at full power. You can simply unplug one, leave it unplugged for a long time if you want, it's gonna run fine with two and plug a new one in when you have it. If you happen to lose two, which I would say would probably never happen, but you never know, uh, power will drop to 50%. There are two sizes of heat exchangers, uh, depending on the size of the liquid cooled transmitter. In some cases, there'll be more than one heat exchanger required, depending on, you know, if there's multiple racks, uh, certain power levels will require multiple heat exchanger systems. So there's a very, very small one with two fans, a slightly bigger one with four fans, both are really actually physically quite small. I put the dimensions, both metric and imperial at the bottom, so you can see. Typically, these are mounted on the side of a wall or on brackets um, from, the, from the floor, from the ground uh, outside the building. One more nice feature, programmable auto reversing fans to clear the debris. So basically, you can set up a time interval, say late at night, the fans reverse for a minute or two. Um, to blow out any leaves, any debris or insects in the opposite direction that might be embedded in the uh, cooling fins. <clears throat> this is a, I didn't have any really good pictures, I apologize, but the ones I did have, you can see um, lower part of one of the racks shows, a bit hard to see, but there are two pumps. One's on the right, it's at an angle. It's a Grunfoss pump. Um, very efficient, very reliable. And there's one on the left that's pointed backwards. So it's a bit harder to see. It's an identical pump. Of course, we have auto switchover, which allows it to transfer immediately from one pump to the next. If there's a failure, or of course, you can manually do the same. So everything's built in. Uh, on the right, you can see a glass tube, which is actually filled normally with a mixture of um, antifreeze and water. This is the top up tank, it's eight liters, and basically um, it enables the system to automatically refill if it detects there's a low level of coolant inside the system. <clears throat> so the next slide, number 29, shows a chart just showing model numbers in analog and digital power levels in uh, four different power levels, because in this case we have OFDM power levels, we have DAB power levels, we have HSC1 power levels, which in this product are higher than the OFDM power levels, but we wanted to extract as much power as possible from these products for various um, you know, locations around the world that are using HSC1. And then analog power, so we can support the high power analog market with this product if they prefer liquid cooled solutions. Number of pumps, heat exchangers, uh, number of racks and so forth shown here. And then for band one, we also have that for the very small markets that do have band one, which um, after repack, the USA has managed to hang on to several, in fact, increase the number of band one because of the limited number of spectrum or the limited amount of spectrum available on the UHF band. So you'll see, we also have some band one, low band VHF uh, liquid cooled transmitters. All right, time for the next subject and talk a little bit about our intuitive graphical user interface or GUI and some enhanced security features that we're developing currently. First slide, um, I did this from my home where I am now sitting in my office. Uh, I logged in to a transmitter that happened to be connected um, in the Quincy lab, in, in you know, which is, I don't know, 400 miles away from where I'm sitting, uh, logged in remotely, with a password, 
captured a screen, transmitted was a UXT, UAXTE100, which is pictured here, running at full power. Uh, there's a spectrum display there. You can see along the top, there are on off buttons. There's the log in, log out button. There's a menu which allows you to look deeper inside. An event log button, which brings up a different screen. In the middle, power metering, forward and reflected. Um, some custom information at the very top, where you can put in site name if you like, model number at the top. And on the far right are the performance measurement um, numbers, basically measuring upper sideband, lower sideband, error vector magnitude, SNR, uh, if the linear and nonlinear adaptive correction is switched on or not, um, status, and so forth. And then a spectrum plot. So, and then a little block diagram in the center where you can actually go in and click on the excited, the drive stage, and the output to see more detail. Some little drop down tabs on the left, which give you more detailed information as well that are quick to access. You notice on the right, I logged into one that was running remotely in Italy, <clears throat> a UAXT 150 UC, which as it happens wasn't running at 150 watts, but running at 10 watts, probably due to uh, reject load, dummy load sizing or whatever. But it was running, it's running in a different modulation, it looks like it was on DVBT. Uh, on a different frequency and so forth. But the, the ability is I was able to log in, capture some screens and compare them directly with the HTML5 GUI on the previous um, Quincy design systems. So you can see basically it follows the same format. You can see the same drop downs on the left, the same block diagram in the middle, same type of spectrum plot, even though this is an OFDM spectrum. Performance measurements top right, you know, power metering in the middle and so forth. There's another screen. This one happens to be a FTR frequency timing reference circuit, which is our um, uh, oscillator board, if you like, part of the uh, modulator. We uh, captured the GNSS status. This is the uh, global networking. Basically, it's a satellite system that we're on, which was GPS, and it can do GLONASS or GPS, so forth. Again, the capture on the left is from the Quincy uh, unit. Capture on the right is from the Italian unit. Basically the same. Here's another one where I captured the fault logs and there were quite a few events. We were able to capture events, warnings, faults, uh, information type things that occur. Um, the one on the right is the same. Of course, there's different events and warnings because this is the Italian one. I also found that basically you can easily filter what type of information you want to display. There's a little button called filter. You click on it, which is shown on the right. Um, enables you to display active and cleared or active only faults or cleared only if you want to see what has occurred. And then you can filter out just faults if you just want to see faults or just warnings or some combination of the above. You can also store, uh, save a fault log or print log off as well. <coughs> then I happen to have a slide. I didn't log into this transmitter, but I happen to have a slide of a ULXTE20, which is a 20 PA transmitter, but was running at 10.9 kilowatts in the high power lab in Quincy at some point in the past. Looks like in 2017, so it's a pretty old picture. <clears throat> but what I wanted to show you here is you can drill deep into the transmitter. There are 20 PAs going into PA1. You can see I have PA pallet number one, PA pallet number two, PA pallet number three. You can look inside each pallet. You can measure the status on the voltage current of each, and there are only two devices on each pallet, the current of each device and the temperature of the pallets, the heat sink near the devices. You can really drill down deep into each transmitter and get very, very detailed information, which is very useful, you know, if, if you want to follow trending or see if anything's happening over time, maybe there's a little glitch occurring, you can look at each module and, and basically look deep into the transmitter anytime you want remotely. Another nice feature about our HTML5 GUI screens is they basically auto fit into smaller devices. So the tablet on the left shows a picture basically laid out the same format as the transmitter screen on a normal uh, monitor with the on off buttons on the left, metering on the, in the middle, um, some other status buttons on the right. That is reorganized to fit a a phone if you're holding it upright so that the buttons are fill up the screen a little bit differently and you can scroll down to still see the rest of the information. So all the information is there. It's just laid out in a different way to be more convenient. So I wanted to talk briefly about some advanced security features that we're currently working on and will be uh, applied very soon to our products. 
First of all, email with encrypted security features. So transmitters will have the ability to send an email up to five different email addresses uh, when a fault and or a warning occurs. And you can you know, be able to select if it's just faults and, and or faults or warnings. Encryption can be enabled or disabled as well. Therefore, you can encrypt this data so not just anybody can hack in and look at it. And a fault log could also be attached to this email. So you could open up the fault log and look at the history. And it goes back to a thousand faults of 1000 events. So you can look back a long way. Um, access control list. Basically, um, this enables um, you as the customer to limit who can actually access the transmitter. You create an access control list of basically IP addresses and subnet master of systems uh, of your staff, your engineers, your senior management who are allowed to access the transmitter in an access table. So basically, anybody on that table can open up the transmitter and get in. So, you know, it's a pretty nice feature to have. The next feature is called LDAP or Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Um, basically, if customers are using LDAP already on a network, we've added the client. So if LDAP is enabled in the transmitter, um, the login credentials are sent and configured to the LDAP server to be validated before allowing access to changing um, you know, system parameters. Basically, anytime somebody goes in to try changing the parameters, they need to have login credentials that ma match the LDAP. Um, so if LDAP server can't be reached, credentials are checked against local user accounts and access is allowed if they match. So anybody outside of the system, again, can't get in. So secure web GUI is another thing we, we're adding. Um, as you can see, the, the bad guy here is wearing a coronavirus mask already, so he's up to speed. Um, <laughs> The customer can now select if they want secure web GUI. So basically on our Linux based products, which is most of them, uh, it's a typical HTTPS hypertext transfer protocol secure connection. Basically, that's a very secure connection. I think most of you that use the Internet have seen sites of HTTPS and you realize that that's a much more secure connection than a standard HTTP connection. Some products with less processing power, some of our, you know, products that don't have the processing power to handle the, uh, the HTTPS, we're using a different technology called secure web sockets. And basically, <clears throat> commands and data that are passed through the encrypted socket, the ones that are critical, things like transmitter on off, um, changing configuration, changing modulation, changing parameters in the transmitter pass through the encrypted socket, any non-critical data uh, can bypass that and just go as unencrypted sockets. Which moves me to the next topic. So we talked in the topic at the beginning about an integrated satellite receiver. So essentially, we already have the integrated satellite receiver. It exists in our Gatesair SRL products out of out of Italy. Uh, it's a plug-in module in the front. Currently supports DVBS and S2. A new design is coming. Uh, it's in development now, as several customers are moving on from S2 to S2X, which is basically an enhancement to DVB-S2 for satellite communication. And you know, satellite just distribution and TV programming has become pretty popular in many regions. I know in Africa it's used a lot for DTH, other parts of the world. Major networks use it for network distribution of programming and uh, television programming and data. So basically it's moved on over the years. DVB-S was an original version, DVB-S2. Um, you know, there's more demand today for high efficiency video coding, more compression, but also a lot more data. UH, UHD TV, uh, much higher throughput. Uh, basically, it requires a more efficient um, method of transferring that data through satellites. So there is up to 51% uh, efficiency gain using DVB-S2X, uh, as I'll show you on the next slide. Um, they've also change the modulation and coding or mod cards as they're now called, both at the low ends to allow lower data rates to pass through in very poor signal to noise ratios and mod cards at high end where you need a higher signal to noise ratio but can handle much higher um, data rates. Uh, but interestingly, the low end of the mod cards allows you to run with a signal to noise as low as minus 10 dBs, which is pretty incredible. Um, so I, sh I show you a technology slide here. I'm on slide 41, basically comparing DVB-S2 with S2X. At the high end, you can see there's a definitely a huge efficiency improvement. <coughs> Excuse me, huge increased SNR required to pass through the higher throughput. But at the low end, you see where I called it extended SNR. Basically, where DVB-S2 stops and S2X continues is from 
about minus 3 dB carrot to noise ratio down to just below minus 10. So there's quite a bit of extension that way. Um, finer granularity, because there are 116 different mod cards, almost too many because you don't know which one to pick, I guess. But anyway, there's so many of them. Um, you can basically set the parameters about where you need them to be. Uh, filter roll off. Basically, we're talking about how much of the bandwidth can you use up. The original systems had 35% in DVBS days, 20% roll off for DVBS2. Now you can select what you want down to 5%, which basically enables you to pass more, more use more bandwidth, more available bandwidth. Uh, there's new constellation options for linear, nonlinear channels, channel bonding, different scrambling options, um, and, and so forth. So it's quite an enhancement. More information available on the dvb.org document uh, shown on the bottom here. Um, I know you can't read the block diagram particularly well, but basically that's our DVB-S2X receiver um, showing that we have used some pretty high technology components, you know, different chips for um, the tuner part, the demodulator, FPGA, which are requirements. Uh, we needed a pretty big SD RAM and, a, and basically a, a CPU to handle everything. So, you know, they're, they're the major parts of our new S2X receiver. Um, some specs are shown here. Basically, um, there's the specs along the top. Um, let's see if I can point out anything dramatic here. Basically, it, it also um, uh, handles composite video baseband signal. Basically, it handles analog as well as digital. Um, so the analog, there's an analog option output here. It also supports conditional access modules, so it has support and management of that. An over the air management. Basically, you can update firmware um, over the air rather than having to go, you know, go to the site and do it. Which brings me to the next topic. I think the final one integrated IP content distribution. And that's basically um, our way of saying how do you get from the IP world to the broadcast over the air transmitter world? And basically, the part we do. So we have an input on our transmitters and they all have this. You all have a transport stream over IP input, which enables you to basically uh, encapsulate um, your, your, your signal into an IP stream and then send it to your transmitter by one way or another via basically via the Internet uh, or an IP link of some sort. Uh, we also have something we've differentiated. It's slightly called a native IP transport input, which is used in HSC3. So, you know, why would you want this? Um, these are my thoughts only. I didn't you know, go grab these from anywhere, but I think the most obvious reason is it can be very, very cost effective compared to traditional distribution methods like wire, fiber, microwave links and so forth. I think distribution by, by IP can be cost effective does have high bandwidth in today's you know today's world it's very high bandwidth and getting better all the time relatively low latency which also is useful because you don't want to have any delay anywhere there are very good robust and modern error correcting error correction techniques um, which can be applied uh, it's also useful for point to point but also point to multi-point distribution can be made very secure with vpn you know the various security methods that can be added on top to make it more secure it's obviously very flexible um, so if you look at one of the standards, and basically there's a standard called SEMT 2022, which actually comprises seven different standards. Um, the first two that are listed, 2022-1, 2022-2, .1, 2022-2, are the ones that we've applied into our products because they basically apply to over the air television. They're the most critical. And the list of all seven is here. Um, and you can also find these you know, on the SEMT website if you need more information. Um, so looking at these two, I'm going to combine them together here, 2022-1 and 2022-2. We basically do both of these forward air correction for real-time video audio transport over IP networks. Um, basically, forward air correction is, is done quite cleverly. It's actually done in what I call a, uh, or they call a 2D FEC, forward air correction. Uh, and I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, it also supports constant bit rate, which is what most broadcasters use, MPEG-2, H.264 and JPEG 2000 coded video with audio and ancillary data. So it covers most of your broadcast needs. Um, looking at the very bottom, you can see uh, basically there are forward error correction uh, packets that handle an array. It's basically it shows a hundred packet array, 10 across and 10 down, but the data go from you know one, two, three, four, 
nine, then down to 10 and across and across. There are row FEC packets and column FECs. So how does this all work? It's basically two dimensional because you're going in both directions here. Um, if you have a burst loss where you lose consecutive packets of media, basically programming, um, the row FEC only has one, so it can't replace all of those packets, not possible, but the column one, the column uh, FEC streams can replace each one of those and you have a fully corrected uh, transport stream. What happens if you have random ones? Well, shown here now, the row FECs can work because they're handling them. However, um, there is a case here, um, you know, there could be cases where you have two in the same row, which could be handled by the column FEC as well. So you have two ways of correcting. Uh, in this case, there's, you know, the column FEC, you'd think would also be able to handle these, but look at one where there's two errors in the same column. Now the row FEC, A, F, e, C has to handle that error as well. <coughs> so looking at our products with IP and PUCs, and the product on the left is our Gatesair XDE exciter, which I've already talked about. Product on the right is our ultra compact series, which is an exciter driver that's been developed in Italy that drives all of the products coming from our SRL, um, gates our SRL location. So the one on the left, uh, basically it incorporates two redundant IP transport inputs. And each input can be configured and used for either transport stream over IP or AS over IP. Basically it encapsulates a native transport stream into IP packets. And uh, you know, basically that's what's in an AS over IP stream. It's ready to go. There are two such inputs if you have both connected and one happens to be disconnected or fail or there's a glitch it will switch automatically to the other one <clears throat> and there is timing and, and reset where you can change the number of times it attempts to switch back and forth we also can configure the same inputs for native ip used for hsc3 it's based on a native ip transport uh, layer um, utilizing dash delivery protocol blah 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 i'm not going to read all this out but basically it's ready and can work directly with hsc3 um, ip inputs the ultra compact series just has at the moment the ATSC, sorry, the TS over IP input, also known as GBE, Gigabit Ethernet, because that's the, you know, that's the hardware involved. Basically, it's a giganet, Gigabit Ethernet um, port on the front, and there are two of them. Let me go to the next slide. I can show you physically where they are. On the XTE Exciter, the USA designed and built um, Exciter, they're actually on the rear. There's two ports enabled DTI IP1 and DTI IP2. Again, these can be configured for TS uh, transport stream over IP or native IP. And on the Italian product, uh, yeah, they're on the front. This is the European kind of methodology, but anyway, they're on the front, they're labeled GBE1 and GBE2, and again, there's two. Uh, with both products, you don't have to use redundancy to GBE or two IP inputs. You can use one IP input and one transport stream input one of each and still have redundancy. Um, the GUI screens that I showed you earlier, I didn't open up a few pages, so I went back and looked at the one in Italy, logged into it again, opened up uh, a screen that shows the input status, basically the inputs that are active. This particular one had an ASI connected to port two, shows the bit rate, the format 188 byte, GBE1 and GBE2 are both connected with the same format. Um, and at the bottom it says which one selected satellite receiver was selected. So there was actually four active inputs on that box. Only one of them, of course, can be selected at one time. There's a lot more data at the bottom. Green lights are good, red lights and yellow lights are bad. So everything was good there. Um, I went in one level deeper. If you click on the GBE settings, you can see a bit more information like MAC address, IP address, uh, receiver parameters, multicast, um, destination port and so forth. So all these are configurable within the system. And that, uh, let's see how we're doing for time. Good, 55 minutes. Um, I'm gonna hand this back to Keith. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time in listening wherever you are in the world, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, I think we're open for questions, Keith. We sure are. And Awesome job, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, so before we get into the QA portion of this program, let's get some quick housekeeping out of the way. So again, um, and I see at least a couple of people have done it. Um, there is a Q&A pane here in the Microsoft Teams live events 
uh, system here. And so if you answer your questions, we'll answer. If you put your questions in, we'll answer them in a first come, first serve manner. This webinar's recording will be available at the same link that you use to sign in here. Um, and it'll also be available on gatesair.com and on our YouTube channel later today. In addition, we'll be adding it to our educational video library at gatesairuniversity.com, which is our online hub of lessons and webinars about broadcast engineering. And we encourage you to visit and browse through a lot of great material there. And if you didn't know, this webinar, like all webinars on gatesair.com, uh, qualifies for one half SBE recertification credit identified under category I of the SBE's recertification schedule. So for more information on that, you can visit the certification section at SBE.org. So now on to uh, the questions. I know um, Martin is replying to one of them, but uh, for everyone who's listening and not reading, um, when will the liquid cooled VHF transmitters be available in the United States? And the, and the answer is VHF liquid cooled transmitters are already available um, for sale in the United States. We've already taken some orders, we've shipped. Um, delivery may be a little bit longer because of the issue worldwide with the coronavirus, but um, we'll do our best to fulfill any orders that we've currently got, make them on time. Uh, the one that we uh, were taking to NAB that never actually got shipped um, is going to Quincy for some further testing and evaluation, but basically that the product's available for order now. Um, can't give you an exact time on delivery, but we will know soon and we'll update everybody when we find out. Awesome. And um, uh, another question from the same person uh, was, will all the slides be available for download? Um, I, I know that we're gonna make them available for the sales team. And in general, we try to provide a PDF version on our website as well under uh, the presentations segment of our media center at gatesair.com. Um, how do you feel about that, Martin? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> no I'm volunteering yeah. your slides. Okay. Yes, uh, I, yes, they're available. Um, uh, I sent you a link, Keith, already, so you'll find them. Um, uh, you'll you'll see you. a link in your inbox when you look. Yep, yep. I received it and I appreciate yep. that. So yeah, we'll, we'll do our part to get um, all this content available today um, for review. And um, that said, Martin, if people wanted to get in touch with you personally by email, um, what what uh, what okay. is your email they address? They can use the email address as if you if the current slides are still being broadcast. Martin it is M A R T Y N dot Horsepool H O R S P O O L at gatesair.com. Please send any questions you have. If I don't know the answer, I will get the answer for you. Fantastic. Um, I know that we are actually at the top of the hour here, so um, really once again, this webinar is going to be available um, on our site, at our YouTube channel, or um, just by using the same link that you used to, to watch this one. Um, and again, feel free to check out gatesairuniversity.com. It's really worth a visit. Um, Thursday's virtual event will be Next Generation Radio Transmission Systems, which will be dual presented by Ted Lance and Kevin Heider. They're going to review a range of new products at various power levels, including um, things like advances in high efficiency transmission, um, how we're tackling HD radio, DAB, and uh, DRM solutions even. So for those of you who are listening to this and are also radio broadcasters, you will not want to miss that one. And if you have any ideas for future webinar topics, you know, including course material for Gatesair University, please let us know at marketing at gatesair.com or you can email me directly. I'm Keith. Uh, my email address is kadams at gatesair.com. Um, so yeah, and I also see that uh, Ever um, at uh, Meditel in Peru was like would like the slides too. So I'll, I'll send them your way. Um, so other than that, I think we will uh, we'll cap this off. And um, again, thanks, Martin, for for this wonderful exploration of our newest TV offerings. And to everyone out there, thanks again for attending this first of the Gates Air Connect virtual events. So for Martin Horsepool, this is Keith Adams saying see you next time. And hey, let's stay connected. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Martin. <laughs>